Hello everybody and welcome to the first AS Chemistry Carlam Cymru revision session of 2023. Now the session this evening will focus on chemical calculations and specifically um, the typical kind of approach we suggest to exam questions and exam techniques themselves. Now this presentation will be done by Mr Black from Penglai School in Aberystwyth. The session will hopefully last around about 45 minutes when Mr Black will run through the relevant content with you. If you have any questions, of course, during the session, please use the question and answer section and we'll do our best to answer you during the session itself. You will see that there's already a hyperlink in that question and answer section for you. Now, if we could kindly ask you if you're happy to leave your name and email address, we would love to keep in touch with you so that we can send you information about future events. Now, you can click on that link at any time during the session itself. Today's session will be recorded and the recording and any relevant resources will be uploaded then to the ESGAL website under the Carlam Cymru tab. Thank you very much to you, Mr Black, and over to you. OK, thank you for the introduction. Um, so, yeah, uh, good evening. And you'll see the first slide we've got here states is chemical calculations. And the reason I've chosen chemical calculations is off the advance notice from the exam board. And it comes as no surprise that one of the main components that they're going to get marks from are doing calculations in your um, unit one exam. Uh, that's nothing <laughs> as a surprise. That, that That is pretty much what you'd expect to see. So I, what I've done is I've gone through calculations uh, that you're likely to come across. Obviously, I can't do all of those calculations and I can't tell you how to answer every single calculation. That's going to come down to you and hard work and practice and making mistakes and learning from those. Um, don't leave practicing your calculations to the last minute. They're something you should be working on all the time. Um, they're not something I found particularly easy when I did my A-levels. As I tell my A-level students, I'm very good at them now, um, but I have to work hard at it. So work hard, practice and you become a master. All right, so let's um, start off then looking at some of the calculations that we might come across. So before we get on to the calculations, um, the WJC love their uh, definitions. So I went on the uh, knowledge organisers that are available on the WJC and I just thought, well, you know, what what kind of, was a particular um, definition I wanted? Actually, it's not one of these, but I thought, well, you know, these are definitely worth kind of being familiar with and learning, not making them up on the spot, kind of just have it ready to go um, and just quote it ever verbatim, okay? Um, so relative mass terms, but it's this one here, particularly I'm interested in with our calculations, uh, what a mole is. So I'm not gonna read it out, you can read. Um, what I'm particularly interested today is this term here, molar mass, okay? And you'll see why in a moment. So, there we go, I've highlighted it there. That's my kind of focus for the first part of today's session. So um, molar mass, why, why are we focusing on molar mass? Well, you're quite often asked to work out a molar mass or how much does one mole weigh? And you will see in a moment um, from my experience of questions, uh, students can go down a whole rabbit hole on that sort of question. And basically what they're asking you to do on a molar mass is calculate the MR value. If they ask you to work out one molar substance, they are asking you to work out the MR value. Now, I've lifted this straight off a of GCSE uh, PowerPoint that I did with Carl and Cymru. Um, I'm hoping you're OK with me just skipping through that very, very quickly. Uh, and you can hopefully work out for yourselves that the MR value comes out as 98. However, not in your exam. It's not going to come out as 98 because if you go to your syllabus, uh, so your periodic table, uh, hydrogen is not quoted as one, it's quoted as 1.01. So when you're doing your calculations in the exam, don't be lazy and just use one because you will lose marks. Same with the sulf, it's 32.1. Um, so yeah, it's just a good idea to make sure that you include those decimal place values in your calculations. If you like my students and like myself, um, I don't use them. Maybe it's bad practice not to when I'm in the classroom, but on exam paper, make sure you do. OK, um, I'm stating the obvious here. I'm not making any assumptions. Some of you may not know this. I'm hoping most of you are looking at this and going, come on, get on to the, the difficult stuff. But you can see here, um, 
when you're working with uh, something like calcium nitrate, um, you've got the oxygens, you've got three inside the bracket, so you need to multiply the 16, which is the uh, AR value of oxygen, by six, okay, which gives us this value of 164. Um, again, I'm, you know, you're here, some of you will be fine with this and you'll know it already, others of you might not have that sort of depth of understanding with it. So it's the same with um, a molecule. So if you've got a molecule, um, the mass of your molecule, your molar mass is just the MR of the molecule. So you've got 18 grams of water is one mole of water. All right, so if you ask the mass of one mole of water, it's the MR value, which is 18.02 grams per mole. Okay, so that brings us to this formula triangle. <coughs> Absolutely crucial, you know, this formula triangle. There's a couple of formula triangles that we're going to be looking at tonight. Um, you're not given these in exam, you're expected to recall them. Most people are okay with this one moles is mass over MR or molar mass. Okay. So here's a A level question then, and um, I, I'll show you why I think people go complete down the rabbit hole with this one. On the first question, calculate the mass of one mole of sodium carbonate. So people look at the question and go, oh, OK, so we've got all this information. We've got the moles, we've got the mass in grams. And I've seen some really elaborate calculations that are wrong because, as we've said, the mass of one mole is the MR value. That's all they're asking you to do on that first part of the question. And unfortunately, the rest of the question relies on you getting that first part right. So if you don't get this first part right here, as you'll see in the calculations, as you've probably seen, um, answers kind of flow into each other. So you're kind of making yourself a bit of trouble if you don't get that right. So we'll focus on this first part here. I've just zoomed in on for you. So the mass of one mole of sodium carbonate, as you can see, all I've done is I worked out what the molar mass is. Now, actually what I, what I should do on that slide there, Technically, you won't lose the mark for doing it, but I'm teach you. Um, molar mass is gram per mole, g mole to the minus one. So that should be 106 g mole to the minus one. Um, so it might be a good idea to throw that in there for the examiner. Um, so here we come on to a calculation now. Okay, so we're working out the um, molar mass of this sodium carbonate. And you can see here that you can't work out the MR value for this because we don't know how many of these waters are present. We'll be talking about these waters again a bit later. Now, these are called water of crystallization and there's an unknown quantity of those. So we don't know, we can't work out the MR, so we can't say what one mile would weigh. So what do we do? Well, look, you know, as I'm going to say to you over and over during this session today, look at the data. What have you been given? Well, if we look at the data, uh, we've got this hydrate, OK, so we've got the hydrate, we've got its mass and we've got the number of moles. And being really familiar with your formula triangles is, is going to help you massively because you need to kind of say to yourself, OK, is there a formula triangle where it can help me work out an MR value or includes MR as one of the quantities? And of course, it's this one here. OK, so to work out the MR of your uh, sodium carbonate with these waters attached, you just literally do your mass divided by the number of moles. So an unusual um, use of that formula triangle. You know, normally with this formula triangle we're working at moles of substance or mass of substance, but here we're using it to work out the MR value given our mass and the number of moles. So that comes out as 286. And as I said earlier, we'll just move on to the next part of the question where we work out how many of these waters are present. Hopefully you can do that yourselves now. But um, the the questions flow into each other, so you can see why it's so important to get the first part right. So what we do here then, um, like I say, be conscious that what you've worked out in a previous part of the question, like part one, will probably be used in part two and three. So uh, we know the molar mass of the anhydrosodium carbonate, that was uh, 106, and the hydrated is 286. So the difference in mass uh, is 180, and you can see here, I didn't do it on my uh, animation, the difference in mass 180 grams, with each water being uh, an MR of 18. So 180 divided by 18, there were 10 waters present, okay? So, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can't teach you how to do a calculation. I can 
demonstrate how to do a calculation. It really does come down to you practicing and practicing and practicing. And I think one of the ways I got good at doing calculations was by doing practicing calculations that I could do, because by doing that, I was learning the strategies and the thinking processes that were involved in doing these calculations. So, you know, if you if you want to or you think you benefit from it, um, you may want to go back and just look at that calculation again. Maybe try it yourself. See if you get there to the same point. There's absolutely no harm in doing that. OK, so there we go. Um, to just so, cut across there. Oh yeah. So just to just address a quick question that's come in. So somebody's asking if they don't get the first section correct, whether um, they would lose every mark for that question. Well, it yeah. The the problem is is if they can have a value where they can work out the difference. So they they would get the second mark if they use the formula triangle to work out the MR value of the um, hydrated. Um, but unfortunately, to then work out the value of the uh, the waters, I've got to subtract a sensible value off. You could, you could, I guess, on part one, make up a sensible value to subtract. That could work. Um, and then they'll do an error carried forward. But it's, it's, it is unfortunate, you know, when you come across questions like that, that sometimes the next mark relies on the previous mark being correct. So you know play the game though always play the game and think well i don't know the answer i'm going to make something up where i can subtract that off and say how many waters there are good question okay um so i hope that, that answers that for you so we're going to move on to empirical formula um always surprises me when people don't know how to write an empirical formula for a question like this um you know empirical formulas let's look at a definition I doubt you'd be asked to write a definition of empirical formula, but just knowing what they are. And it's, you know, it's the simplest ratio of the elements. So we've got this silver ethane dioate. OK, and what we look for in these is a common factor. So we've got a common factor of two. All these values are divisible by two. So we divide them by two and there's no other common factor now other than one. So we've arrived at our empirical formula. So we've got this empirical formula of AgCO2. And one of the things I always talk to my students about with empirical formulas is, um, well, what's the point of an empirical formula? Because surely a molecular formula is a lot more useful to us. So I always like to give that context of why we have empirical formulas. And the reason is, it's the very first thing we find out about substance. We'll, we'll find out the empirical formula and then from that we can then go on to work out the molecular formula. So, um, you know, this is kind of like a GCSE thing, so I won't spend too long on it. But it's that getting the idea across that, you know, you can perform an experiment, obtain some data, use that data in order to work out your empirical formula, which then you can use to work out your molecular. So you can see in this experiment, they've, you know, They've put some magnesium in the crucible, they're weighing it, they're heating it, and then they're looking at um, what's happened to the mass. And they can then from that see what the mass of the magnesium was, the mass of the magne uh, oxygen, and they can then work out the formula, which I will we'll go through with you today just quickly. Uh, the one thing I'm going to point out here on this data, the one thing I don't like about that data is you need to heat the crucible and the magnesium to what's called a constant mass, which means you wait more than once. So I would, if I was doing this experiment, I would, wouldn't would settle at 34.94. I would further heat and I would keep heating until that mass remained the same. OK, so that's what I mean, heating to constant mass. Obviously, if the mass is going up, not all that magnesium is reacted. So just pointing that out to you, constant mass is a very important concept. You may be asked about it. OK, so um, what we do then in this calculation, we look at the mass of each element that's reacted. So um, I hope I've done this right. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I'm, oh, yeah, no, it's telling me what the masses are. You can see the mass of the magnesium. So they've worked that out from this data here is 0.22 and the mass of oxygen, which is 0.15. OK, um, you may not know what you're doing with an empirical formula. Why are you dividing by these AR values? So this is the AR relative to atomic mass of magnesium, and this is the AR of uh, oxygen. You're working at moles. All right, so you're working at the moles of each atom present. You'll see in a moment why I stress the word atom. 
So when we get that, we get these two values and here we get a lovely ratio. You know, sometimes people panic because they're not exactly right, but near enough for a one to one ratio. And um, just to point out, I often pe see people kind of finish the calculation at that point. Don't forget to write the formula. OK, so formula there, one to one ratios, MGO. OK, good. So um, the ratios you get out. Um, I, I'm going to talk to you about the ratios because uh, it's quite handy to not recognize some ratios when they come up. So if ever you see a ratio where you've got a 0.25 value or a 0.75 value, even if it's a 1.5 or 2.75, multiply that value by four and you'll get to a whole number. OK, so it's really worth knowing that ratio thing, 0 0.25, 0 0.75. Obviously, if you've got a 0.5 value, multiply it by two, 1.5 times two would be three, so on. And if you get a 0.33 value or 0.6 value, uh, 6, 6 value, multiply by three, OK, and you'll get to your whole number value. OK, so it's a little little tip for you. Hope that is handy. And in fact, I think on the next slide you'll see it is. So we've got a hydrocarbon. Hopefully you've started your organic chemistry. And you'll know that hydrocarbon, even from GCSE, contains two atoms, carbon and hydrogen. And we can see here that the uh, hydrogen must make up the remaining two grams of that 11 grams. So I've divided each of the um, uh, elements by the AR value to see how many moles of these atoms we have. And we get nine over 12 and two over one. OK, and that gives me on your calculator, you'll get 0 0.75 to two. Now, uh, when uh, one of the things that people will do um, when they do empirical formulas is then they'll divide by the smallest value to work out what the ratio is. Uh, uh, doesn't work here. It doesn't look it doesn't come out nice at all. Um, so hopefully you recognize got a 0.75 value and you recognize right times it by four. OK, so I'll just put that ratio table up there for you. So times it by four, that turns it into three. And then it's whatever you've done to the carbon, obviously we have to do to the hydrogen. So we times that by four and that gives us our whole value ratio then three to eight. And that would give us the um, empirical formula C3H8. OK, so really little handy uh, ratio um, table to remember. Uh, if your values ratios aren't clear, so you don't have like a 0.25 or a you know 0 0.1 to 0 0.3, um, then you're going to have to use this concept of dividing by the smallest value and it, they will come out as a, a pretty clear ratio. They might, when you do that, come out as a 1 to 1.5 ratio, in which case then you would go up, oh, right, I'll double up now. And I think we see an example of that in a moment anyway. Right, um, just to point out, if you're given a percentage mass value, don't panic. Uh, it, they're just like having a mass value, OK? So I'll give you an example. Uh, the percentage mass by sulfur and oxide of sulfur is 50%. Therefore, the oxygen is also 50%. And then we just do um, work at the moles of atoms. So you can see there, I've just taken the percent and divide by the AR values, OK? And you get your ratios there. If you can't see the ratio, I can see it. You might not be able to divide by the smallest one and you get your ratio of one to two. So empirical formulas worth worth practicing, you know, and uh, what I always say to my students um, is you've got to kind of at this point start thinking about what's worth investing your time in, in terms of picking marks up. So if it's something that you find incredibly difficult, it may not be worth that investing time in it at this point. Maybe focus on the things that you think you're quite good at and you might be able to do. Become an expert in those. All right, because those will get you the marks. And then once you you know you're good and confident in those, perhaps then start thinking of moving on to stuff that you find a bit more challenging, which we may cover today. OK, so um, the next thing, like I said, um, empirical formulas kind of useless other than that they help us find a, a an, an MR, OK, so molecular mass. So I've got an example here. Um, we've derived the empirical formula of a substance. It comes at C2H4O and it's got an MR value. Oh, so yeah, it's got the MR value 88 grams per mole. OK, so molecular mass of 88 grams per mole. We can use this information to work out the molecular formula, which is a lot more useful to us. By the way, just you know, 
where does the MR value come from? How do we find that? Well, hopefully you know that would be using a mass spectrometer. All right, so it would be the highest peak value that you get there. OK, so you can get an MR value from a mass spectrometer quite easily. We can derive the um, empirical formula from experimental data by me you know, measuring masses. And then basically what we do is we plug our information into a little formula like the one below. OK, so what I've got, I'm not, I'm not sure how to kind of convey this, what I'm doing here, so I'm just going to, I've written this down, hopefully it'll make sense to you. So what I've done is I've taken the MR value of our molecule, which would be the 88, and then this is a bit, I'm, I'm not sure I'm saying it technically right. It's the sum of all the AR values in the empirical formula. So, you know, obviously, let's see what I mean by that. So I've got the MR, 88, I'm dividing by the empirical formula, AR values added together. So you've got the two carbons, you've got the four um, hydrogens, each weighing one, and you've got one oxygen. OK, I think that comes out to 44, which means we get a value of two. And then what that tells us to do is double your molecular formula. OK, so it then becomes C4H8O2. If the value came out as three, OK, then obviously it would be C6H, oh God, I can't do the mass, 12, O3. OK, so yeah, um, that's, I think, pretty much um, basic empirical formulas. I'm going to show you a lovely question now. Uh, this one, I did this one um, uh, after an exam and I checked the mark scheme and I got the wrong answer. And I was, well, I thought I got the right answer and I was kind of, oh no, there's something wrong here. The exam board have made a terrible mistake. And then I went, I've oh, no, I'm an idiot. So let's let's work it out. Let's have a look at this. So we've got this titanium, 9.6 grams and Oh, it's not a mass of oxygen gas at 298K and one atmosphere. So we are going to look at gas volume calculations a bit later. Um, the, the, the main thing that I'm going to point out to you here is that this is what we call standard condition. Um, no, our room temperature and pressure, 298K. And that would be quoted on your book of data and we will see some of these calculations later as being 20 24.5 decimeters cubed the volume of one mole all right so that's really important there and i think if ever you're if ever they're talking about gas and they talk about temperature and pressure look for you know rtp and stp which we've got here um so you can see there you got the molar gas volume as 24.5 that's quoted on your uh, data book or the front yeah the front of your data book and because we've got this uh, this molar gas volume that we know we can use this formula triangle here okay which is basically your moles the map substance is the volume of your gas divided by the molar gas volume so there you go i've worked how many moles of titanium i've got and this is the point i've worked how many moles of oxygen molecules i've got now, an empirical formula is the ratio of atoms to atoms, all right? Not atoms to molecules. So what I do in the next step, this is what I didn't do initially when I did the calculation, is I convert that to moles of oxygen atoms, all right? So now you can see we've got our ratio 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. And then hopefully you also can see the ratio there that you've got this formula ti to o3 okay ratio of two to three times by ten times by ten okay happiness i hope so okay so another is it an empirical formula calculation kind of it's it's called a water crystallization calculation so we can see here these these are our water crystallizations there's the sodium carbonate when we did earlier uh, 10 water molecules two water molecules five water molecules these all make up the mass of our of our salt our crystal right those waters are included in its mr value so um a really really common question is uh, where you're working out the the number of water molecules and um it's a bit different to the one we did earlier. OK, so that was a different way of um, different style of question with water uh, crystallization. Um, this is a very, very common question. So basically um, what we're going to do in this one, we're actually going to work out the moles of the salt. OK, 
Okay, not moles of atoms this time. We're working at the moles of salt and how that relates to the moles of water present. So it's a moles calculation. Uh, we need to work out the mass of the salt and the mass of the water. So you can see we've got the mass of the hydrated salt and we've got the mass of the salt once it's been heated to constant mass of four grams. So hopefully you'll be able to see um, what your masses are. You've got your four grams of copper sulfate. You've got your 2.25 grams of water. So the next step then is to work out how many moles we've got, which is your mass divided by your MR. And we get these two values out here. <laughs> I've got you know, lots of values in there, but you, you don't need all those decimal place values. Um, but what we'll do now is we'll finish off by working how many, how those kind of values relate to each other. And um, yeah, it's the moles of the water divided by the moles of salt, okay? So the moles of water is 0 0.12 and the moles of salt you divide into the moles of water. So that'd be 0 0.025. OK, and you get a nice round number of five. So we know now that this value was five. OK, so it's like an empirical formula, but we're not working at moles of atoms this time. Uh, when we're working out water crystallization, we will work out the moles of salt and the moles of water. And then we look at the ratio between those two things by taking your water, number of moles, it's going to be the bigger value and divided by your smaller value to see what this comes out with. If you get them the wrong way round, like I sometimes do, you'll know instantly because you won't get up, you'll get a decimal value. You just go up, switch it around and you'll get the right value. OK. So there you go, there's your formula, there's your X value, it was five. Um, just look, I haven't done a calculation on this, but if we're working at the MR value there, you work at the MR of the copper sulfate, and then you take the MR of water, which is 18.02, and you multiply that by five and add it onto that value. So if you are asked to work out, you know, the molar mass, the MR of copper sulfate, work out the mass of the salt, MR of the salt, multiply the MR of water by five, add those two values together. Okay, so. Now, the next one, it uh, always amuses me that my students um, sometimes get atom economies wrong. And I know why it is, actually, and I do it every year. It's such an easy thing that um, I always kind of skip it and say, oh, it's, it's in your notes. Uh, just do it for homework. And we don't really massively go over it. Um, so I thought I'd include it today. So um, atom economy, it's quite an important part of uh, your green chemistry. So you can see here, um, it asks you uh, why the atom economy won't be 100% for this reaction. Okay, So there's um, various things you can say. Um, you get other unwanted products. Uh, you might get a methanol form, and also you don't just form, um, i.e. the other unwanted products are the, the methanol and the water. So in this case, if we only formed this substance, we would have 100% atom economy but not all our atoms have been converted into um, our product. OK, so that's why you haven't got 100% atom economy. So how do you calculate atom economy? It's very simple. First of all, you have to establish what you're trying to make in the reaction. So in this case, it'd be aluminium, um, in which case my atom economy then would be found by the following method. You take the MR of the substance. In this case, it's just aluminium, so it's just 27. If it was a, a molecule, you'd have to work out the MR. And you multiply it by the number of um, in front, okay, the stoichiometry, which is why I've taken the 27, multiplied it by four. And then the other thing you do is you take the um, MR of your reactants, every single one, and you multiply them by their value that's in front of there, them in the bounced equation. So this is the MR of the um, aluminium oxide, and I've doubled it because of the um, two in front there. Size so by 100, simple. Okay, so literally identify what you're trying to make, work out MR, times it by the value in front, divide by the MR of all the reactants. So if there are other reactants here, we'd be adding those onto this value here. Okay, so uh, moving on. Then we'll, we'll move into our um, kind of reacting mass calculations. Did them at GCSE. You may have been good at them then. You, I, know, I don't know how you're finding them in year 12, so you might still be struggling with them. 
So let's have a quick look at this then. So calculate the molar mass in grams per mole of phosphorus five oxide. Well, if you've been listening, you'll know they're just asked to work out the MR. OK, so you've got the MR here of 284 grams per mole. All right, now the next bit is the reacting mass calculation. Uh, calculate the maximum mass of water which can be removed by reacting 28.4 grams of phosphorus 5 oxide. Now, when you do a moles calculation, all you have to do is look at the question and say, what can I work the moles of? OK, so there's only one thing you can work out the moles of is the phosphorus 5 oxide and it's given us the mass. So you'll know there's a formula triangle that involves moles and mass, which is that one. OK, so be aware. And I think OK, mass, I know the formula triangle I'm going for. So your moles is your mass divided by the molar mass, which is why you worked it out in part one. Going back to the question I was asked earlier, by the way, if you got that value wrong there, it would then be error carried forward, I imagine. I'd hope so anyway. So yeah. Uh, anyway, once we do that, we get 0 0.1 moles of the P4O10. So what do we do with that? Because we're trying to work out the moles of water. So like any reactive mass calculation, in fact, any moles calculation really, we then look, need to look at the, what I call mole ratios. I think the posh way of saying it is stoichiometry. And this is where we look at what we call our known to unknown. And I'm going to tell you now, and I tell this to my students, and most listen, but some don't. You need to write known to unknown. You know, especially if it's not a one to one ratio. To be honest, if it's a one to one ratio, don't worry. You don't need to do that because it's one to one. You won't get it wrong. But where it's not a one to one, write known, write unknown, write down what you know, the P4010, write down what you want to know, which is the water, because we want the mass of water, and then go to the equation and write down the value that appears in front of that substance. So that's a one in front of the P410 and a six in front of the H2O. So I put a six there. I'm telling you now, if you don't put known to unknown, you'll do it the wrong way around. There's one in 50 chance, uh, one, one in two chance that you will do that. So it's, it's definitely worth doing. So I know my 0 0.1 moles needs to be multiplied by six. That means I make 0 0.6 moles. What good is that for me? Well, I'm trying to work out the mass of water so I can go back to my formula triangle now, which is my moles multiplied by the molar mass. And you can see there, that's what I've done. My 0 0.6 times by the molar mass of water gives me 10.812 grams. By the way, whenever I do a calculation, I always look at the answer and think, well, is that sensible? Does that make sense? And yeah, it's not, you know, it's not a bad answer. It's not wildly different. So we'll go with that. OK, just the other things. Well, significant figures. Um, exam board are a bit weird with their significant figures. They kind of change their minds a little bit. But generally, the rule to go by is you quote your answer to the number of significant figures that they give the, the answer to. The one thing I will tell you, though, and I keep stressing this to my students, is when you're doing your working out and you're writing down values, round the values, um, don't truncate the values. So what I mean by that is don't just cut numbers off, round up when you're cutting off numbers, all right? Because on the working out, if your working out hasn't been rounded, uh, you've just truncated, i.e., you know, your, your value um, that you're cutting off is five or, five or above, you need to make the number in front bigger, okay? If you don't do that, you'll lose marks on the, round, on the working out. On your calculator, do not round out. All right, if you round out, you're going to start losing marks. Um, keep that value on your calculator till the very end. So kind of get used to using the answer button or using brackets when you're doing your calculations. OK, uh, just very quickly, um, look at this reaction here then. Um, I was just going to talk to you. I haven't done a calculation with this, but I wanted to talk to you about percentage yield. So. If you're working at percentage yield of a reaction, um, there's a very simple formula to use, and it's just what you are, what you have actually made in a reaction, and you divide that by what you could have made in the reaction. So this is like a value, the theoretical yield. Uh, yield. Uh, that's where you would do a reacting mass calculation. Okay, so they'll tell you what the actual mass made is, and then you'd have to work out what this value is using a similar technique to what we've just done in that calculation.
Right, we're at about time, so I'm going to quickly go through titration. Titration is where we're usually at year 12 adding acid to base or base to acid. And we've got a, a titration here. This one's looking perfect. Here you can see they've added far, far, far too much of the alkali. OK, uh, it's gone way, way, way too pink. So they've got a slight pink tinge there. I uh, got some data here. Um, this is terrible, terrible data for A level. Uh, just one thing I wanted to point out, though, if I was going to use that data, um, to work at a mean value, I'm um, just going to show you here. I will not be doing that. Okay. Um, obviously, the 16.9 is um, way, way, way off. Oh, sorry, the 26.2 is way, way off. It's uh, no, not following the pattern. So it's what we call anomalous. So we'd exclude that from our average. So we'd only be adding those values together. And the other thing I'm going to tell you, it's GCSE stuff, but hey, um, press equals before you press divide or do these values in a bracket, because if you don't, your calculator will use bit mass. It will divide 16.9 by three and then it will add these values on. Um, that's the value you get on a on a scientific calculator. You'll know you're wrong, so you should double check yourself. That does not lie in our range. So you, you've done that error of not taking account of bit mass. So there you go. Um, now, here's a, a thing that you need to know, really important term we would call it, say that these results are not concordant, right? What that means is they're not close enough to each other. Uh, to be concordant, um, and I've checked this on the WJC just to make sure what they say, and they say they have to be within 0.2 centimetres cubed of each other. So these results are not concordant results. They would not be kind of good results for a practical. So I've got a question here. Um, and you've got some results here, one, two, three, four, and five, and you'll see that these results are technically concordant, okay? Um, they're within 0.25, technically. Uh, you'll notice this one here isn't though, and uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, hopefully you'd recognize that that first titration is called the range finder. And the range finder is the one that um, speeds up the titration process. So you're quite often asked, you know, about the range finder. What is a range finder? What's a rough titration done for? So it's just so that it shows you where to slow your titrations down. Um, so, you know, you typically here, if you're doing this, you'd stop at 18 and then add slowly after 18 to get these results coming in. Uh, just put some questions here um, just so that you know what a base is. It's a proton acceptor or sept hydronines. And um, a practical thought in the method, overshooting endpoints is a really common one um, if your result of titration is too high, which it usually will be. You typically not below, you typically add too much. OK, the calculation, that's what we're here for today. So uh, we're being asked to work out um, the concentration of this acid. So the first thing we get in the calculation is to find out what the mean volume of acid that we've added the sodium hydroxide to. So we ignore um, the non-concordant result and we get a mean volume of 18.60 mil. OK. And how are we going to use that? Well, we want its concentration. So uh, we need to form a triangle, which I don't think I put it there yet. Um, we need to work out how many moles of this iodic acid there are in this 18.6 mil. So that's why we've done a titration with sodium hydroxide. And if you look in the question there, you can see you've got a volume and you've got a concentration. So if you've got a titration question, when you read the question, you need to identify what it's giving you the volume of and the concentration of. That is what you'll find the moles of. So we've got our concentration multiplied by the volume. And please don't forget if it's in centimetres cubed, divide your volume by a thousand. I see it all the time people forget to divide by a thousand. You are throwing marks away. So we come out with our moles of sodium hydroxide here. And then what we need to do is, like we did earlier, go to our mole ratio. Uh, here it's a one to one. So the moles of sodium hydroxide is equivalent to the moles of this iodic acid. OK, so actually I haven't done a once uh, a known to unknown because it's a one to one so i know my moles of the iodic acid in the 18.6 centimeters cubed is the same and now i can work out my concentration what i haven't done on my powerpoint and i wish i had was to put the formula triangle and that's so important you learn that formula triangle and even i sometimes get that formula triangle wrong so 
kind of ingrain it c n over v the actual units of concentration are quite helpful as well because they tell you what the formula triangle is because it's the moles divided by the volume you can see it there moles per decimeter cubed and while i'm there by the way a decimeter cubed is a litre all right so here's another question um, i'm bringing in another topic here we're looking at ph um, which technically is not 1.3 but you know it's still linked with our moles calculations and they may ask you to work out a ph of a solution why not so ph you should know is minus log base 10 of the hydrogen ion concentration that they haven't told us but we can work that out by the way in the exam if you're asked to define ph you literally write that expression that's how we define ph so how do you find the concentration of hydrogen ions in this solution well we've got this uh magnesium hexafluorosilicate 2.6 grams you've got a mass you can work out the mr because you've got the formula okay so there's the moles of the um magnesium compound and what we need to do now is we need to look at the ratio of this substance we know the moles of to what we want to know the moles of which are the protons okay so uh that's a ratio of one to four so i've multiplied this value by four okay and now i can work out my concentration now very nicely in the question there uh, the volume is one decimeter cubed, so your concentration is the same as the number of moles. And now just is minus log base 10. Well, that value gives me a pH of 1.20. Uh, pH values always quote to two decimal place. Um, yeah, so that's a fairly basic question. Uh, let's move on. I put this on the slide for you. Um, because we're going to start looking at gases now uh, not really much time but there you go um quick question then uh we've got hydrogen forms with aluminium reacts with sulfuric acid um when i do a moles count question i i ask myself two things what can i find the moles of what do i want to find the moles of okay so if you look at this question again we're being given the uh, mass of the aluminium okay great i can work out the moles of the aluminium okay and the next thing i always say to myself is right i know the moles of aluminium what do i need to know the moles of well they're asking me to work out the volume of hydrogen so i need to work out the moles of hydrogen so i've got the moles of aluminium um how does it relate to the hydrogen we look at the balanced equation and you can see our mole ratio here okay so wait me a second so there's my known, the aluminium. There's my unknown. It's a ratio of two to three. OK, so I'll take this value. I divide it by two and multiply by three. And that gives me 7.28 times 10 to the minus three moles of hydrogen. Now, next bit is then using that value. OK, so we're being asked to work out the volume. Uh, look at the temperature, 25 degrees C, one atmosphere. Fantastic because what you may start to panic and do is use this expression don't because <laughs> you don't need to and it's a not a very nice calculation that one uh, you could use it that would work out your volume by rearranging to that however because it's at stp rtp you can see they've been quoted here uh, this is your 25 degree c1 atmosphere so we've got molar gas volume of 24.5 second Okay, so all I've done is I've gone right, my moles is my, so my volume, which I want, is my number of moles, which we've calculated, multiplied by my molar volume. That's my number of moles, that's my molar volume. So I get 0 0.178, job done. No, it's not. Units. Okay, so what are the units here? Well, because you've done it in decimeters cubed, that's in decimeters cubed, and it asks us to work it out in centimeters cubed. Okay. So you can see your conversion there. One decimeter cubed equals a thousand centimeters cubed. So multiply your value by a thousand, and that gives you an answer of 178 centimeters cubed. And then finishing off, then I just wanted to show you that you could use the ideal gas equation. Um, I wouldn't personally. Uh, we only use this equation if we don't know the molar gas volume. So if they don't tell you it, or it's not at RTP, STP, then you have to use this expression. 
Um, and the problem with this expression are the units. So I'll just very quickly cover the units with you because I can. That's my moles of hydrogen. This is off the data book. It's the uh, gas constant. This is my temperature. Um, it has to be in Kelvins in this expression. So I converted from 25 degrees into Kelvins. And this is my um, pressure. Now, they give it in atmospheres. I've converted it into um, pascals, not kilopascals. If they give the value in kilopascals, easy, multiply it by a thousand. If they give you the value in atmospheres, then you just multiply it by this value here. So for example, if it was two atmospheres, it would be two multiplied by this value. And that is actually written on the data book as well for you. You can see it there. So that's written on the data book. Look for it if you don't know what the conversion is. OK, and I get this answer and you probably think, oh, my God, that's wrong. That's an incredibly small volume. It isn't. It's because the volume in this expression is in meters cubed. OK, so the ideal gas equation volume is in meters cubed. Remember that. So it's worth knowing if you want to go uh, from meters cubed, you multiply to centimeters cubed, you multiply by 10 to the 6. OK. And you can see why there. Um, because you can see one meter cubed is 1000 decimeters cubed and one decimeters cubed is a thousand centimeters cubed. Thousand times thousand is 10 to the six. So when you do our answer, you can see here it's 178.5 centimeters cubed, which is what we worked out earlier. And then finishing off last one, because we're doing the gas calculations, you can see there, um, those are the laws that you need to learn. In these questions, really, uh, they're going to ask you for a new pressure or a new volume, um, and they're just changing one of the conditions. So if we look here, they do it under the same pressure, and they're asking to work out um, uh, what the volume is at a new temperature. So that would be Charles' law. I'll just show you now very quickly. There's Charles' law. So I've taken my... Um, original volume this is v1 and my original temperature now the temperature has to be in kelvins okay so i've um, done it uh, added 273 to this give me 297 and i've got my new volume this is the volume i'm trying to work out v2 and this is at the new temperature at 52 degrees c then i just rearrange so i've got v by itself so i'm going to multiply by the 325 and I get my new volume and that comes out as 137 centimetres cubed. So I'm going to finish there because it's time. Um, I wish I had more time. Just going to show you some other things that are on there, um, which you can access on the PowerPoint. There's uh, working at a KC value from Equilibria. You'll notice on the um, mentioned on the um, booklet. Um, I've got my products. I've squared the value because of this two, and I'll divide by the reactants. I've cubed this value because of the three there, and I'll just plug my numbers in, and that gives me a KC of 0 0.119. And to work out the units, I've just taken my units, and I've kind of you reflected that I'm squaring here. So you see that's mole to the two, dm to the minus six, and this is mole to the four, one there, three there and dm to the minus 12, minus three, and then minus nine. Okay, and then what I do is I cancel out and I can open that unit there. So something that's definitely worth looking at is, is KC, because so they do mention that on the exam. I'm sorry I've gone over. I hope I haven't rushed, but remember, you can pause. Um, you'll find uh, the link to this video online. So, you know, I suggest you work your way through it, but slowly. Hope that's been of help. And uh, next week, um, I'm not sure what we're doing, Miss Stevens. Yeah, so thank you, Mr Black there. I hope you all did indeed find today's session useful. Next week's session is focusing on bonding. Um, so yeah, we hope to see you then and hope you had a good evening. OK, thank you. Good night.